Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Anara Tabishaliva, along with co-host Dr. Victor Fett, Dr. Katerina Shrey, and our program producer, Professor Larry Shrey. We host a weekly discussion panel on Russia's war on Ukraine with guests from Ukraine, military experts, medical personnel, academics, artists, literary figures, and relief workers. Our panel is recorded and circulated nationally and internationally. We appreciate your comments and feedback. Special thanks to Marshall University Libraries and MUIT for making this weekly event possible. If you're joining us live on Teams, please feel free to use the chat to post questions for our guests. A quick greetings to our viewers in Ukraine from uh, Professor Katerina Shrey. Welcome to our viewers in Ukraine with a strong support. Medal of the Medal of your extraordinary suffering and also of your great strength. Everything will be Ukraine. Thank you for your participation in our weekly program. Thank you. Today's guest will be introduced by Professor Victor Fett. The rest of us turn off uh, your cameras and uh, thank you. Thank you, Anara. Uh, we are uh, honored to welcome today Dr. Katerina Shinkaruk from Washington, D.C., joining us with her talk on the war implications for the European and Euro Atlantic security. Dr. Shinkaruk's background is in international relations. She teaches. Uh, at uh, Eastern uh, courses in Eastern European politics, Ukraine's foreign policy, and theory of international relations. She is affiliated with Texas A&M University's Bush School in Washington D.C. and also with the Ukrainian University of Kiev Mohyla Academy. She is also a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment, and we welcome Dr. Shinkarok on our weekly program in our 78th weekly meeting. Welcome. Microphone is yours, Katerina. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor, for your kind introduction. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for your, you know, uh, commitment to this weekly project. And it is my honor to join you today. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, sharing my screen to to begin the presentation. Just give me a second. Do you see my screen, right? Yes. OK, wonderful. Uh, so today we are going to have this conversation about how Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine uh, has created a new security environment in Europe and what are the uh, implications for European and of course uh, Euro-Atlantic security. Uh, the main questions I wanted to discuss and I hope that we just, you know, cover some ground on it. Uh, but we will uh, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, it will be interesting to uh, to have a conversation with the with you and with the audience about those questions. Uh, these questions are: uh, What has the Russian invasion of Ukraine revealed about the Euro Atlantic security order? How did we get there? And how does the process of accepting new security reality is going? And uh, what a post-war Euro-Atlantic security order could look like? Um, I would like to uh, start with uh, basically uh, discussing uh, some uh, a little bit of history here. Uh, sorry. A little bit of history here, uh, just in the lead up to the uh, Russia's uh, full scale invasion of 2022. What were the uh, major preconditions that created a security gray zone in Eastern Europe, Ukraine included, and uh, how the post Cold War, war uh, or security order actually uh, led up to this? 
uh, the question here is about like when when I say security gray zone, it means basically the the absence of security, uh, a sort of security a vacuum. Uh, for those countries that uh, emerged uh, in Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War, the, the collapse of the USSR, and were not uh, admitted into uh, Euro Atlantic security community by men membership in the EU or NATO. So, first of all, what was uh, priority number one after the collapse of the USSR was that. Um, was the denuclearization that was like a pr major priority of the, of the United States. And uh, 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 that ended up with uh, uh, those countries with nuclear potential like Ukraine, which had uh, the third world uh, largest uh, nuclear potential uh, being pushed to transfer their uh, nu uh, nuclear ca capabilities to Russia. Uh, and uh, instead we are offered some sort of security assurances, uh, which we are uh, form, uh, formed in uh, and signed uh, by Budapest Memorandum with uh, signatories uh, uh, like other nuclear powers like United States, uh, Russia and UK. And basically, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there has been a lot in the media about Budapest Memorandum, so I don't need to stop there a lot. But uh, the main uh, question is that that was basically a failure of providing a, a, an alternative, a security uh, guarantee, a security umbrella for those uh, R Russia's newly emerged neighbors uh, bordering with a major nuclear power. Uh, another uh, division line between we, between other post-communist countries uh, that were part of the Warsaw Bloc or part of the USSR, like Baltic states, what happened with them was that uh, basically they were un admitted under, under the security umbrella, in, including nuclear umbrella of the NATO, uh, through the uh, NATO enlargement uh, in uh, 1999 and 2004, but you can see on the on the map that this this enlargement basically continues up up until now. And uh, one correction on this map is that Sweden, thankfully, is already in in NATO as well. Uh, and so basically, what happened was uh, no security guarantees for. Uh, Eastern European countries that gave up their nuclear potential to, to Russia and were not be able to join other Euro Atlantic security community. And then what happens is that uh, basically the discussion on who will be helping those countries to join the Euro Atlantic security community who will be helping those countries to become part of the West through the democratization process primarily was seen um, by EU and US as a some sort of, you know, Sisyphus labor, we can put it this way, you know, a, a ball that was uh, basically uh, each, each party was thrown into uh, other's court. Uh, while uh, seeing, uh, you know, Russia as a prime primary counterpart in uh, in the region, and this is where those Russia first uh, policies, um, you know, have overtaken uh, the uh, Eastern European policy uh, or strategy uh, that actually never emerged. Um, what happened was that. Uh, after the collapse of the USSR, uh, Russia inherited not only a, a seat at the uh, UN Security Council, but basically overall the microphone the, uh, on the global stage uh, from the global power. Whereas uh, those countries that were actually members of the of the uh, of the Soviet Union and emerged as newly independent state, uh, states with a 
with, uh, you know, economic potential, geopolitical ambition, uh, and uh, what's most important, desire to actually move closer to the uh, to the West, we are seen as some sort of, you know, neighborhood. Uh, the question here is also, you know, Ukraine is the if if we uh, if we look at Europe and um, take Russia out of uh, of you know out of the equation, Ukraine is actually the largest country in Europe by territory, uh, slightly uh, slightly bigger than France, but somehow this was overlooked because of the scale of Russia uh, as a new independent state that emerged uh, after the uh, end of the Cold War. And so basically, uh, those Russia first policies created what what is brilliantly framed by uh, one of uh, of US uh, scholars, uh, Eugene Fischel, as a Moscow factor. Basically, it's a sort of a of a permanent uh, presence of uh, Russia's considerations, priorities, interests, or concerns when devising policies towards Eastern Europe by major Western actors and uh, US. This is a sort of a fee or a tax that uh, such countries as Ukraine are permanently paying uh, in, a, in the margin between the attention, the resources, uh, the support it could get if not for Russia, if not for concerns about Russia and how it would see uh, uh, in a hostile way the, this Western co cooperation. Finally, what added fuel to the fire, to the, to the uh, you know, uh, vulnerability, security vulnerability in the region was uh, uh, Russia's wars uh, uh, in Georgia in 2008 when uh, uh, when uh, Russia uh, uh, Russia attacked uh, 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 Valley and uh, uh, in uh, uh, blatant annexation of Ukraine's territory in 2014, with further uh, uh, aggression in uh, Ukraine's east, uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Why I'm saying that this added fuel to the fire? Because uh, of all the messaging that Russia had been, you know, uh, signals that Russia has been perceiving from the West through this Russia first policies and uh, through the creation of the security vacuum in its neighborhood, actually the weak response or sometimes even uh, almost no response as after Georgia's war in 2008 was actually signaling that this is not something that we are uh, in the West, uh, uh, taken seriously enough to reconsider, reassess Russia uh, and uh, its uh, basically nature of this regime on the global stage. Uh, now, the case of Ukraine presents uh, here. It's a, it's an intentional uh, uh, way to put it: escalation failed uh, or uh, deterrence, or basically the escalation. Um, the escalation uh, in relations with Russia uh, and failed deterrence was uh, the result of these uh, factors that I uh, listed. Um, again, as I said, Russia was seen through, uh, Ukraine was seen through Russia first or post-Soviet lenses. Um, in the, on the European uh, mental map. Uh, it probably appeared for the first time during the Orange Revolution of 2004 when uh, Ukrainian people demonstrated that Western values, uh, the liberal values, uh, desire of, uh, uh, you know, freedom uh, and ability to choose its leadership is so important that they are ready to take to the streets to protest and actually demand uh, that their uh, voice is heard, and that's what, what what was the result of the Orange Revolution with uh, you know, so-called pro-Western candidate Viktor Yushchenko uh, eventually winning over a 
clearly pro-Russian and Russia-backed Viktor Yanukovych, that was like a very important signal to the EU um, that actually Ukraine also wants to be in Europe and, and belongs in Europe. And if, uh, you know, Baltic states are in Europe, if Poland is in Europe, uh, why Ukraine could not join? And uh, 2004, uh, in, uh, coincidentally or not, was a, an important year because in that year that uh, EU admitted 10 more states, 10 more members, uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. And Ukraine uh, in 2004 found itself at the border with EU. And so of, obviously the questions uh, Ukrainian leadership, Ukrainian diplomats were asking, like, when can we join? But again, uh, it was maybe a, a premature conversation about uh, Ukraine's EU membership, but definitely it put uh, all these developments in Ukraine put Ukraine uh, more visibly on, on the map of the, of the Europeans. However, based on, you know, this Russia first policies, we can uh, see again that uh, Ukraine's agency, Ukraine's difference from Russia, Ukraine being as a, a separate independent, and sovereign state with its different culture, with its distinct uh, values um, uh, and uh, distinct uh, aspirations, um, actually uh, became known globally and became seen globally, uh, regrettably as late as in 2022, when Ukrainians resisted to Russia's uh, full-scale invasion unexpectedly to many in the world and uh, heroically. Uh, with regard to uh, other, uh, other elements that basically led to failed deterrence of Russia's uh, aggression, we are the ambiguous signals with regard to Ukraine's uh, EU and NATO membership. The, notorious Bucharest summit of 2008, where uh, Ukraine was uh, asking for membership action plan to, to become eventually NATO member. And Putin famously stated uh, in, the, in his conversation with uh, uh, George Bush Sr. Um, oh, sorry, George Bush, Bush uh, Jr. Uh, he stated that Ukraine is a fake artificial state. That was a, a statement made as early as in 2008. And uh, when it was leaked to the press, uh, many just didn't believe it, just dismissed it as some fake rumors. Uh, so, uh, you know, so unexpected, so, uh, so blunt that sounded back then. Finally, uh, a failed deterrence uh, uh, is uh, also uh, obviously um, a result of this uh, absence of security umbrella over Ukraine with the absence of uh, nuclear uh, uh, cap deterrence capabilities and uh, uh, any other security guarantees that would eventually work to, to guarantee its uh, territorial integrity. Um, Another uh, element is um, the fact that, as I mentioned, the, the Russia first policies led up to the absence of a strategic vision for Eastern Europe separately from uh, their Russia policies and Russia strategies. Um, lack of uh, adequate response uh, to Russian aggression or strategy for Ukraine after 2014, that was also Again, the, the the first ever sanctions against Russia were introduced uh, after Crimea annexation, but the real ones, the some tangible ones, actually after the downing of a of the uh, plane MH17 with uh, 300 casualties, uh, uh, mostly of uh, Dutch citizens. So again, when it when it was uh, sort of local. Uh, the situation was seen as a, some sort of conflict in the neighborhood again uh, uh, until it gained some, you know, global, global angle. 
so the response to Russian aggression uh, in uh, uh, since 2014 was definitely uh, bearable for you for Russia um, and did not uh, deter it from any further aggressive moves uh, until the 2022 uh, uh, full-scale invasion, which I call like a costly reality check of who is who and uh, what uh, vulnerabilities uh, uh, were established in the post-Cold War security order in Europe. Uh, Obviously, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, out there about uh, uh, motives for Putin's aggression, but uh, my point here is that uh, his statements about Ukraine being a false uh, or fake state. Uh, started as early as uh, he uh, gained some confidence in his role as Russia president. Already in his address in 2005 to Russia's Duma, he said that the collapse of the USSR uh, is a geopolitical uh, catastrophe or tragedy of the of, of the whole 20th century, not a uh, Holocaust, not a uh, all types of genocides that the humanity lived through, not World War I or World War II uh, and its implications for Europe. No, the loss of, Rush, uh, of Russia's, you know, uh, superpower status, that was uh, his uh, evaluation of the most important um, development uh, in 20th century. Uh, as I mentioned in 2008, he uh, claimed Ukraine is not a, a, re a real state. And finally, nothing new uh, uh, emerged in his later statements to the Ukrainian ear. Uh, when his uh, essay on historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians was published in 2021, uh, many in the West sort of rang the alarm that this is a, a, a build up for a casus belli. For, for you know motive for an invasion whereas in ukraine uh really this sounded like well, well that's unfortunate but nothing new we heard this many times already and uh, of, of course uh, this was just you know a pathway uh, of uh, of russia's propaganda machinery uh from uh you know uh throwing some messages into the audience to socializing and normalizing those messages uh, especially between 2014 and uh, 2022 to the point that uh russian's population would not just believe but actually endorse uh this um i also refer here to uh russian's information agencies articles about uh, uh about uh the invasion uh, because if if some of you may have missed this uh it was a very revealing uh piece uh that was uh, uh mistakenly published on february 26 uh by in russia's information agency where the, uh, the article is basically celebrating victory of russia in ukraine the calculus was that by february 26 kiev would fail uh russia would uh, take over and then uh, russia celebrates a new um, world order where uh, it clearly uh, says that uh, this is not the end of uh of our global and geopolitical aspirations, this is just the beginning. Um, so uh, I will skip this or run really quickly through this because I don't think this is really uh, the most uh, uh, the most uh, informative part, given how many of you uh, already know of the Russia's propaganda narratives. But just you know, to give you a list of. Uh, uh, all types of uh, arguments uh, Russia used when invading Ukraine. Interestingly, some of those uh, arguments uh, are in contradiction with the other, but it does not actually um, pose any problem because uh, uh, Russia propaganda can absolutely 
uh, successfully, you know, socialize uh, totally contradictory narratives. Um, so the immediate implications of Russia invasions to say that uh, uh, Europe, NATO, the West were shocked by this uh, is uh, to say the least. And uh, what was important is that already in March, uh, NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg uh, uh, recognized that uh, Europe is facing a new security reality. And uh, he, later in October 2022, he uh, uh, recognized that um, uh, the way Sweden and Finland uh, uh, were uh, uh, went through the accession process was the fastest in NATO's modern history. So some unprecedented things were happening and uh, the NATO and EU and the US are right in saying that the response was unprecedented. But the, the Ukrainian leadership and people basically say, yes, it is unprecedented. We are very grateful, but it is uh, not at the pace uh, needed to actually grasp this new security reality. Uh, so the first lessons learned from this secu uh, new security reality is that uh, if security gray zone in Eastern Europe uh, remains, this will keep sending Russia signal. Uh, uh, one of the uh, former ambassadors of US to NATO and also representatives, uh, special representative uh, for Ukraine talks, uh, Kurt Walker, um, uh, rightly uh, phrased uh, uh, it that a security gray zone is a green light. Russia sees a gray zone uh, or security vacuum as an invitation to attack. And so, uh, all those elements listed here led up to some failed deterrence of Russia's aggression. And also what was uh, problematic was that Russia's threat after 2014 Crimea annexation was uh, heavily downplayed. There is also, also this was like, uh, explained by you know western western europeans uh, post world war uh, heavy em emphasis on dialogue cooperation this liberal concept of uh, economic interdependence that should be preventing any sort of uh, military conflict uh, this postmodernist and postmaterialist um, uh, european union uh, 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 emphasis on soft security and uh, also in 2021, after the, the you know in the midst of COVID, uh, Biden's administration uh, statements that they are prioritized China, COVID, climate, and finally withdrawal from Afghanistan. All that were was sending signals to Putin that this is a, a right time to to invade. Finally, there is a, a cognitive element, a cultural element. It's about misinterpreting Putin and his actions. I say here projections, 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 and I'm happy to elaborate on this further uh, in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, the main uh, explanation here that in crisis mode, everybody operates in a sort of, you know, energy saving, uh, approach, meaning that uh, we are not looking for explanations uh, that would be counter-cultural or counter-intuitive to us. We are looking for explanations within our own framework of rationality. And this is why uh, it took, uh, for instance, uh, some European leaders like uh, Germany and France quite a while to recognize that Putin cannot be dealt with uh, same approaches as other major um, uh, uh, world leaders. Uh, this is uh, um, actually to follow up on uh, Russia and the right. Uh, I would be curious to hear uh, your thoughts on this, but um, uh, 
one of the uh, very uh, very telling and uh, a helpful metaphor uh, to explain in this way of Russia thinking is actually uh, a, a tale by uh, its classics Alexander Pushkin, basic obviously based on uh, some folklore tales about the fisherman and the fish, where uh, basically the fisherman is being offered. Uh, opportunity to uh, ask a fish, a golden fish, uh, or like a, a tail fish uh, that he he meets uh, at the at the seaside uh, to uh, ask for three wishes. And uh, each time he makes a wish, uh, he goes back and uh, meets his wife, which is always unhappy with what he wished for. She is unhappy when he asked to improve their house and uh, to make them wealthier. She is unhappy when, uh, upon her request, uh, he asks uh, the fish to make uh, his wife the queen uh, reside in palace and that the fisherman would be uh, one of her servants. And finally, uh, the the final wish that uh, the uh, his. Uh, unhappy old lady makes is asking the fish that it becomes the slave of the of, of this old lady that basically it is the lady that becomes the master of the fish and uh, this is actually a, a very telling framework to explain how russia sees the world how russians see the world and what is the end of uh, russia's ambitious ambitions uh, the the end of the of this tale uh, to those of you who who are not familiar with it is uh, that after uh, asking uh, the fish uh, to basically enslave itself and recognize uh, the authority of his wife, the old man comes back uh, and finds his wife in the initial condition uh, by the old house. Always oh, this uh, wrecked uh, wrecked vessel by uh, nearby, and uh, uh, the the moral is clear that uh, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, enslave uh, the the source of uh, uh, of your uh, you know of your of your welfare of your benefits if you are asking for those. Uh, and uh, in this in this framework, I would say that the West, uh, in in a way, uh, tries to see some rationality in uh, in Russia's uh, wishes when it when it hopes to bring Russia, for instance, to the negotiating table. And uh, uh, many in the Eastern Europe, uh, in Ukraine, and in post-communist Eastern Europe, like Poland uh, and Baltic states realize that this is um, not a realistic expectation from uh, Russia as a negotiator, specifically because it will not stop until it is actually stopped by uh, external powers. Uh, to wrap up, I would uh, quickly run by the key factors, key elements of a security order in Europe that would actually create some uh, sustainability. It is uh, uh, what is needed is a realistic assessment of Russia and adequate deterrence policies towards it. There, obviously, there is needs to be a unity and resolve, but uh, uh, most importantly, getting rid of the security vacuum in Eastern Europe, and uh, you know, and and put the end to those signals of. Uh, you know, uncertainty, uh, uh, lack of dis de decisiveness towards Eastern Europe and where it belongs, uh, whether in the West or in some sort of gray zone. Um, international rules-based order uh, will not be uh, maintained or affirmed if uh, this war does not end in a way that would actually uh, strengthen it and uphold it. Finally, uh, 
EU and NATO uh, should coordinate uh, their security and defense policies and efforts when integrating new members like uh, Ukraine and Moldova, who are EU candidate states already. And uh, uh, recognize that without, you know, uh, looking at the new security reality uh, with full honesty, uh, that without the, the tectonic shifts in how the Euro, uh, Euro Atlantic security order needs to be organized, there, there will be only some sort of, you know, superficial remedies that would uh, lead to a pause in Russia's aggression, but will not stop it. Um, this is a good question to uh, wrap up uh, my presentation with. Uh, whether Ukraine uh, should be part of new European security order, new Euro Atlantic security order. Uh, it is already, um, uh, as I said, candidate member for the EU membership uh, candidate state, but um, its aspirations in NATO are currently uh, a subject of a debate. It's been a very hard and painful debate in Vilnius, and we can expect same type of uh, debate in uh, Washington summit uh, in uh, next year, uh, where uh, NATO leaders will again assemble to discuss uh, the future of NATO, and Ukraine will again put uh, on the table the question of its potential membership. And here, based on everything I already said, I would say that it is very important to uh, to see this um, uh, this NATO response through uh, through the framework of Russia's aggression, not only being a territorial land grab, but also being actually a war against a rules based order, against Western led um, order, against European security order. And uh, under this, uh, uh, within these lenses, it is clear that as long as Ukraine is left outdoors for no matter what good reasoning, for Russia, it is a, an invitation to continue its invasion. I would like to give us more time for questions and answers, so I am happy to elaborate on this point further. And I will stop there. And get back to you. I will probably stop the sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, so that we can all see each other. Thank you very much, Dr. Shankaruk, for a crystal clear and all embracing digest of this uh, many years, I believe, not just the war years and years leading to it. It's always good to hear and see what led to modern history. I will leave my questions for later. I will invite now our panel and viewers. We have several people live. So please, uh, questions or comments, open your microphone. Thank you so much, Dr. Shinkaruk, for, for your presentation. Thank you so much. The, the use of the folktale to demonstrate that the, the situation was Brilliant, and I'd never heard that one before. That was incredibly helpful. Thank you. Um, in your presentation, you offered to elaborate on misinterpreting Putin. You had projections, projections, projections. I would be very grateful if you were to elaborate on that. I'd be um, curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I believe I could address you, Katerina, right? <laughs> yes, please. Oh, please do. Please do. Yeah, so thank you very much. And we are namesakes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Projections in terms of how, you know, uh, this post-World uh, War II um, cultural framework in Europe has emerged, primarily in Europe and maybe also in the US, but that's like a, in, a, in, a, in a second order way. Uh, that uh, dialogue framework is the best way to avoid conflict, that, uh, you know, there has to be always a space for different opinion. Uh, there has to be always room for negotiations. And this is like the projection of sort of, you know, rationality and normalcy uh, as a uh, as a benefit of the doubt, we could we could call it. Uh, that was uh, heavily attributed to Putin. 
and uh, even like he, when uh, when there were made assessments about will he invade or will not or he will not invade is he a rational actor or is he irrational i would exp explain that he is a rational actor but he is acting in a framework in a cultural framework which is better explained by the laws and uh, cultural codes of uh you know criminal world and uh, i am not uh, scared to be you know overstating this because uh, uh if we look at the origins of the uh, russia uh, secret service not from the imperial times but from uh, soviet times they uncovered there which was the transformed later in kgb and then now it's fsb this is you know this is just a, a criminal uh, uh value framework where uh, where the the power has to be signaled in the right way strength has be has to be signaled and you are actually uh, re respected and uh, recognized as a as a counterpart by the by your decisiveness to act by your um, readiness to be brutal and to actually resort to hard power to harsh power to harsh decisions this is the way they are reading their counterparts and so any type of offers to have a phone call you know as president macron notoriously has been trying to reach out to putin many many times um all of these uh invitations for negotiations uh, they were seen like when when the west says let's talk what uh what they mean is uh let's talk when putin hears let's talk he means we are ready for concessions wow wow that's really helpful thank you thank you very much thank you for your question i have a question uh, too thank you very much yes uh nora please okay sorry i just need to louder so poland awaited the eu membership 20 years Turkey applied in 1987 and still waiting. So that's not easy process. And uh, could you highlight the Ukraine's uh, challenges on its way to the EU membership and what the EU can and what e the EU can do in order to help Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Well, yes, uh, Poland waited for 20 years, Ukraine for 30 years. Uh, in the, even more now, don't really know when exactly the uh, accession uh, date will will be. But at least what we are thankful for is for this, you know, paradigmatic shift in seeing Ukraine as part of Europe, as part of the EU, with recognition of its candidacy uh, status in 2022. Um, Ukraine uh, has. Uh, been you know vocal about uh, its desire to be part of the European Union. Uh, I would say uh, in a more direct way, straightforward way after the 2004 uh, enlargement, as I mentioned, and Orange Revolution, and um, the way towards EU has uh, has. Um, several dimensions for ukraine obviously it is uh, reforms it is the large scope of you know uh, um adoption of eu uh, a key communitaire its internal legislation it's a, a lot of you know convergence of uh, of standards but that's something that uh, ukraine has uh, made already uh, uh, significant progress uh uh on uh given that it has a association agreement signed with the eu uh in 2014 and it took uh, effect in 2017 and it includes deep and comprehensive free trade area and this deep and comprehensive free trade area is a is a massive in scale framework for 
uh, bringing Ukraine closer to the EU in terms of its economic standards, trade standards, and lots of technical standards. Uh, association agreement also includes political and uh, um, uh, uh, political section and rule of law section, and these are also important uh, uh, reforms. Uh, in 2017, Ukraine signed the uh, visa liberalization with the EU, which was a, a, a seminal moment in, you know, uh, letting uh, Ukrainians travel without uh, a, a need for, you know, lengthy and tedious process of visa application. And that was also uh, something that helped a lot many Ukrainians when they had to flee the war in 2022, because uh, at least for 90 days they could stay in in the EU and then they they could receive this temporary protection status. Uh, also during uh, the, the this, you know Russia's uh, full-scale invasion and you, many Ukrainians traveling to the EU, I would say that the silver lining is that the people-to-people -people cont uh, contacts have enhanced. Uh, so I would say that you know a lot of progress is made. There is a lot of work still remains to be done when it comes to actual the practicalities, not only uh, on Ukraine side, but also on the EU side, because as, as I showed you on the map, Ukraine is a big player and admitting it into the EU, including uh, to the EU agricultural market, is a, is a huge, uh, you know, a shift in the so-called balance of power internally. It would affect the composition of European Parliament, uh, be, uh, which is elected based on the uh, number of population of the member states. Uh, it is, um, you know, it, it will basically uh, change the balance in so many uh, in so many uh, aspects that now the EU actually needs to do some homework. Not only Ukraine, uh, you know, is charged with homework in this accession process. Now there is uh, some homework to be done on the side of EU. But uh, from the historical point of view and from the, you know, geopolitical point of view, um, from political point of view, uh, we can see that EU finally recognized that Ukraine in is to the benefit of the of the union just as much as it is to the benefit of the EU of the of, of Ukraine. Sorry, so it is a mutually beneficial process, and uh, for many uh, considerations, including security ones, and uh, it took uh, it took European Union uh, several decades to come to this realization, and it took Ukraine three revolutions and a war. Thank you. Thank you very but, much, uh, Anna. Yes. say thank you very much for this uh, 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 reply. I, everything is clear now. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are waiting on more questions, please from audience. I will ask my own. You didn't say too much about United Nations. Um, so, uh, is your take? Uh, I will be blunt. Is United Nations or its Security Council especially, especially of any use or uh, this system doesn't work and will have to be restructured? Well, thank you for this question. I yes, I did briefly only, but really only briefly mentioned that they basically the the inability of the UN or or, or OSCE, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, to become you know a meaningful platform uh, engage in Russia and uh, the West into into the di dialogue, uh, actually shows that uh, there is a, a need for some uh, other or reforming of existing or creating new uh, mechanisms. Um, the conversation about e UN's, uh, you know, inefficiency, uh, given that China and Russia have veto right, is, a, is an ongoing one for quite a, quite a while. Um, I would say that uh, the, main, uh, the main factor that precludes proponents of reforming UN uh, dramatically 
from you know actually uh, disbanding it and creating something uh, some sort of a different uh, different organization is actually the the, the recognition that uh, the uh, shift of powers and balance of power has uh, changed uh, as a, as compared to uh, to the post World War II uh, situation in a way that not necessarily will be to the advantage of uh, the rules based liberal order. So if we actually discuss it uh, now, we need to bring uh, uh, Latin American, African, uh, Asian powers to the to the table. And uh, if we look at the way they vote, if we look at the way Russia succeeded in uh, pushing its narrative there, we recognize that actually the majority vote will not necessarily be the one we, we want it to be. And this is the problem. So what what I see uh, what I see happening is that actually uh, those uh, you know Western democracies trying as much as they can to make out of existing uh, structures uh, some sort of you know uh, more more efficient uh, more eff uh, like produce more results with uh, some you know uh, maybe uh, partial reforming. Like there is a conversation now at the level of the UN about reforming it, and the problem is that uh, it's a, it's a, it's not just bureaucratically, institutionally very complex process. It is politically very complex process. But bottom line, I know it's been a long answer to your to your very direct question. But, um, given that it is unlikely to create something like UN. Uh, and you, uh, everybody tries to hold on to what exists and to make the most out of what exists, for better or for worse. Thank you. So we're talking about using antiquated mechanisms to fight ancient challenges. Uh, any more, any more questions, please? Our viewers and our panel. I have a Dr. question. Mac Can you Dr. hear me? McAllister, yes, we do. We don't see you, though. OK, uh, I just really wholeheartedly agree with the idea that Putin's attack on Ukraine is an attack on the rules based international order. I've made that point in a number of speeches I've made around the tri-state area as we try to raise money for Ukrainian refugees. Um, but I think it's part of a, and I've written about this, and I want to see your reaction to it. This is an across the board effort by Putin to undermine democracy, um, that he has been aiding these ultra nationalist, even borderline fascist political leaders across Europe, intervening in the election in the United States in 2016, and his relationship with Viktor Orban and all the folks that you know of, that this is really part of a very systematic attempt to undermine both democracy and the rules-based international order. And that makes the war in Ukraine absolutely vital that it is that Ukraine win this war. Thank you. I, I completely agree with you. Did you want me to respond to this in some way? Yeah, I mean, if you can elaborate on that in any way, um, that this is a <laughs> that this is a very fundamental turning point in um, the history of uh, of our attempt to build this rules based international order. Yes, uh, basically, as I said, the cultural framework uh, of Putin is uh, KGB, and uh, it's not just him; it's the whole, you know, elite thinking uh, around him. This is not necessarily how they would, you know. Uh, label it, but these are the cultural roots of it. And uh, uh, the, this is like the, the techniques are subversion, uh, you know, with secret, uh, secret undermining uh, of the enemy uh, in direct and indirect ways, like hybrid ways and, uh, as we could see, uh, uh, kinetic ways. Uh, and uh, Putin has been very carefully and cautiously testing the West before taking 
next step every time. He's much more cautious uh, about any, everything he does than the West actually uh, thinks. And, you know, there is this conversation about the US government's self-deterrence when dealing with Putin, which is unhelpful. And I would agree that this is unhelpful because uh, any self-deterrence for him is a signal that there is, you know, room for for uh, escalation on his side, room for further uh, further advance. And the reason why I'm talking about uh, this uh, when answering to your question is that uh, any any type of success, any type of advancement only emboldens him. This is like the logic behind his actions. So if he succeeds at least partially in Ukraine, this will definitely, uh, you know, reassure him to continue his uh, subversive actions against the, the West, against the liberal order. And obviously, when uh, we are talking about uh, uh, rules-based order, uh, we have to put, bring China into the equation. China is watching. China is also watching what, what, what will be the result, how the West responds. And it is, uh, you know, making notes and lessons, uh, uh, derives lessons out of uh, uh, what are the limits of the Western self-deterrence? How you know? How do you actually uh, succeed in uh, in deterring and in, in undermining the Western unity if 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 these things actually happen? So uh, I would say that yes, uh, if uh, if Russia succeeds, China draws uh, lessons out of uh, of Russia's success, uh, then. Uh, the West, the United States, uh, and uh, uh, the European Union and other uh, democratic powers will find themselves in a very different world uh, with, uh, you know, also uh, countries of the so-called global South learning their lessons from, from, this, uh, uh, from this situation. Thank you for that. I, I absolutely agree. So there is a question in the chat. So I will read uh, read the, the question aloud for everyone. Why do you think various Western leaders, some of whom should know better based on his KGB background, were so eager to treat Putin as someone who played by the rules? I looked in his eyes and saw a man I could trust, said uh, George W. Bush. Yes, this is a very good point, and thank you. And this is, again, a question of projections, a question of cognitive fallacies, because uh, um, this is a question of what I want to see and what my comfort zone tells me to see. And, up and, and this is very human to actually have those, you know, defense mechanisms towards reality, which may be so uncomfortable that recognizing it is costly, costly for my uh, identity, costly for my comfort. Uh, I, as you know, as a Ukrainian uh, national, I was in Kiev uh, on uh, February 24th. And I will, you know, in, in full honesty, uh, admit that uh, I was also probably in denial because uh, I couldn't think of this, you know, uh, craziness of sending uh, sending uh, missiles to bombard Kyiv, of thinking that you can actually in come into Kyiv with tanks and instill a president that Ukrainians would accept. To me, this was all like craziness, and I was in denial. And so uh, I do not uh, judge those Western politicians who didn't have their capitals uh, bombarded by Russia's rockets, uh, and they are still in denial. They still didn't wake up to this new reality. But uh, my point is that it is in the national interest of the US government, it is in the national interest of those Western leaders who are still are you know, trying to preserve some sort of old reality uh, to actually wake up to the new one and to recognize that, you know, as N. I. Einstein famously said, you cannot address uh, problems with the 
uh, with the way of thinking that you created them. Uh, so you have to actually, uh, an another follow up on this is uh, you cannot uh, keep doing the same thing again and again and uh, expect a different result. So uh, you cannot uh, address Russia challenge without rethinking and reconceptualizing the uh, previous approaches. And I would say that, uh, uh, you know, sticking to some sort of comfortable reality of dealing with Russia as a normal actor and hoping to return to uh, dealing with Russia, uh, you know, as business as usual is actually what uh, what contributes to this uh, cognitive fallacies. Thank you. This is absolutely great conversation and extremely clear. I might say much more than uh, you can hear on any news outlet. So we're so lucky to have you here and have really an expert. Um, I know we have to go soon, but uh, if you can stay for a couple of more questions, I'm sure we'll appreciate it. And of course, my next question is um, your vision of the victory of the Pirimoha, um, because we all know the point, the points of President Zelensky, but uh, time-wise and space-wise, what what do you envision? Maybe uh, what we can live to see soon. Uh, yes. We are not talking. We are not talking about possible war of attrition for a decade. I don't think the West can afford it. Well, basically, no one can afford it, but. Uh... Uh, this is, you know, your question is uh, very close to the question of on whose uh, side is time. And Putin yeah. believes that time is on his side. And uh, the West is scared about it because it is concerned that actually uh, uh, it can run out of uh, resources, uh, weaponry and uh, finance and political will given the elections. And so all these concerns are valid. But uh, all these concerns are based on the fact that the, the, there has been no systemic, you know, uh, framework, no, no, uh, or change in the, you know, systemic change in sufficient way that would ins uh, ensure sustainability of response to Russia's aggression. Uh, and uh, you know, some some work still needs to be done in explaining why. You cannot localize this war. You cannot think that if you just leave Ukraine with Russia, this will not go beyond Ukraine's borders at some point in in the kinetic or you know non kinetic way. Uh, another element, as I mentioned, uh, is this you know war against the West, war against uh, uh, democracy, war against uh, uh, European project as a as a liberal project and the uh, US as a as major transatlantic partner of the EU. Uh, basically, uh, Putin has uh, clearly identified who is his ma major counterpart in this uh, war uh, in 2021, when he uh, dis dismissed uh, any uh, negotiations with the EU or Ukraine and said he will only talk to US and NATO. So these are his counterparts. This is the war he is waging against uh, them. And this is where the, the most decisive response needs to come from. This is where he can he needs to get the, the most uh, uh, the strongest signals. Uh, um, for the moment, we see that the signals are stronger than expected, but not to the degree that would actually uh, push him back or convince him that time is not on his side. And uh, I uh, I may say something not uh, too popular among Ukrainians, but if I were to choose uh, as the end game for this, if I were to choose Ukraine in the West or Ukraine in the gray zone, I would choose Ukraine in the West. Uh, even if it meant that, you know, uh, there would be still some sort of, you know, uh, front line that needs to be uh, that needs to be finalized to Ukraine's advantage, uh, with you know, with basically a basically restoration of all Ukraine's territories in a delayed way, 
but you know saving ukraine as economy as democracy as a state within the uh, the western euro atlantic uh, security community uh this is something that i you know when you choose between bad and worse this is what i would choose but uh, obviously there's still a chance in my view to to avoid this uh, choice and to actually help ukraine uh, uh regain its territories uh even you know even if it will take uh, some time this is a very hard question, and uh, I, 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 I'm sure you, 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 you understand that no one has a, a good answer right now. Uh, but uh, in realistic terms, this is, uh, this is my way of thinking about it. Thank you so much for your uh, great and candid answer. We have one more question from Yefim Simon, please, Yefim. Uh, hi, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, you just partially uh, answered my question. My question was going to be, um, what in your opinion would be a victory uh, in this case? Uh, and, but but part of the reason uh, I, I was uh, asking that is that um, uh, unconditional capitulation um, was a crucial um, part of why uh, Germany uh, was uh, changed from a Nazi state uh, to a democratic state now, uh, we're pretty much likely are not going to have a conditional capitulation of Russia, which means that essentially it's not going to change. Um, so, I mean, if you could, could expand on that a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a very great addition to uh, everything I wanted to say about Russia, but obviously couldn't cover everything in one presentation. Yes, uh, basically, when we are speaking about Russia's future, there is one major fallacy in the uh, when they think like that it is a uh, it is too inhuman, too aggressive to wish for Russia to actually some total some total destruction. It is a, uh, it is not for the West to decide about Russia future. All of this, you know, talking points that actually stick to the to the thinking that uh, it will be against Russia's interests and against Russia's uh, uh, future to help the to help it collapse. Uh, as a result of this war. But in fact, in my view, if I were not as a Ukrainian, but just as an international relations scholar, which I hope I still, you know, am able to maintain some sort of a distance uh, to, to, to these questions, if I were asked what's the best for Russia from historical and geopolitical uh, perspective, it is the best way for Russia to actually, there is only chance for Russia to follow the footprint of uh, Nazi Germany and become a uh, uh, democratic Germany with a powerful economy and strong democracy is actually to fail, to, to a sort of hit the wall and realize that it's an impasse, you, you know, that something needs to be changed. And uh, it only it, it's only helping Russia to hit the wall that the West can uh, can uh, uh, help Russians, but also uh, contribute to overall regional security. In that in that event, yes, in that event, Eastern Europe will uh, will definitely feel much safer. The ideal is to have Russia, you know, become a democracy. This ideal, unfortunately, was. Uh, um, was you know pretty much uh, uh, replaced by wishful thinking in the West throughout 90s and 2000s. But there is a chance to actually help Russia now understand that there is no way forward uh, on the current path. Okay, thank you. But but still, I think the difference is that the Germany uh, completely capitulated and was occupied. Um, that is unlikely to happen to Russia. 
I think. Yes, it is unlikely to have to for for someone to occupy uh, Russia, <laughs> and it, I, there is no such appetite in the West right now, obviously. But what I'm saying is that uh, it's a long and painful process. It's just you know like. Uh, in 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 dealing with uh, some uh, uh, you know bully or abuser, you cannot uh, help them uh, overcome their toxic behaviors without owning the problem. So they first need to recognize that something is wrong with them. And given how successful the brainwashing and propaganda machinery has been. They will not recognize that something is wrong until you know it, it becomes undeniable. And uh, my my point and my problem is it is there is still too much of a delusion in the West that uh, there are uh, some alternatives to this uh, for Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shunkarok. This was another great question and answer. If we uh, do not have my, any any more questions from our viewers, uh, I will thank Katerina for participating in our panel. It's an honor to have you here and uh, we will uh, have um, if, if you want to say a couple of more words for us, please. No, thank you very much for having me and it was a great conversation. Thank you all for such insightful questions. I really enjoyed talking to you and I wish uh, all the best to, to, to all the team uh, of this project, to you, Victor, and to your colleagues, because this is a very important endeavor. Thank you. And I will ask Dr. Shrey to say a couple of greeting words to our Ukrainian viewers now. Дорогі братя і сестри в Україні, ми зберігаємо вас у наших щоденних думках і молитвах. Нехай милосердний Бог тримає вас у своїй опіці. До наступного тижня прощаємося. Слава Україні! Героям слава! Героям слава!